glory to God. I want to encourage everyone, take our time and watch yesterday's service. It was really powerful. Um, we even had some of the blogs that picked up the stories of the healings. And I mean, <sighs> at some point during the conference yesterday, I just sat on the stage and I was just in tears. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. All right. Glory to God. All right. Let's get to teach God's word today. Will you please turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 28 in verse 10. And today I'm talking about keys to encounters and turn around. Keys to encounters and turn around. One of the things I want to ask you is this, just very powerful. Someone says, what is an encounter? Because people always say this often. They always say, oh, divine encounter, this encounter. What is an encounter? That's where you start from. An encounter is a defining experience. It's a defining moment. It's a defining moment. So, for example, that guy that is here was deaf in one ear. He would never forget yesterday. The way his faith will shoot to another level, will be entirely different. Because something happened that would change the total paradigm forever. Even we that our ears are okay, we cried like babies because he was like, we knew how God could do it, but seeing how God did it was wonderful. That's how powerful an encounter is. It's a, it's a defining moment. It's a, and people, nations have defining moments. People have defining moments. For example, you know, in Nigeria, the defining moment will be when Abiola died. There was something definite about that day that affected the way we thought about democracy. A defining moment for the whole of Africa was the release of Mandela. It was a, you know, we were here, we don't, we don't live in South Africa, we live in Nigeria, but the whole of Nigeria was jubilated. I remember the day he was released. I, I don't know, I even think they closed down schools that day. You know, you, you went back to school and they released it because everybody was just jubilated. It was a defining moment that there was an end of colonialism in Africa. So, encounters are very powerful. Moments like this are very powerful. So, you know, and the reason I'm saying so is this. God grants encounters for a specific reason. Because God does not waste resources. Look at Saul. Saul was a, was a hardened, very tough guy. He was killing Christians. Then one day, Jesus appeared to him. He said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He said, why are you? He says, I am Jesus who you persecute. The Bible says he fell down the hearse. Why? He had an encounter. There's nobody that has an encounter and stands up the same. Because something changes. Something shifts. It's not, see, it's a definite shift. See, you know, let me say something to you. When people say, I don't believe in God, I don't believe in prayers, sometimes I do not blame them. Because they've not experienced it. This is what the apostle said. He said, the things we teach you, which our eyes have seen, which what our hands have handled. In, <laughs> in Genesis chapter 28, very powerful scripture. This is very powerful. Genesis chapter 28, let me see if this microphone would work well for me. Praise the Lord. Okay. In Genesis 28, very powerful scripture. Very, very powerful. I'm going, to, I'm going to read to you, but I want to give the background. In Genesis 28, Jacob had taken the blessing of his brother Esau. So, he was running away because he knew he was in trouble. You know why he knew he was in trouble? Jacob was a shepherd. Esau was a hunter. What does hunter mean? He, the job description of a hunter is to kill. So, Jacob knew that Esau would have no problem at all. To kill him. He took off. But he took off. But remember that Jacob was a butter child. His father was rich. His mother was rich. Everything he had was provided for. As he took off with nothing. For the first time in his life. He had nothing to start with. That was not his experience. And he was running towards Laban. He didn't know what he would meet there. 
other than his other than his father, other than his mother say, my brother Laban will take care of you. That's all. Then as he was journeying, the Bible says, it got dark, then he slept. Then God, then he saw a vision in the dream. Angels ascending and what? Descending. And God appeared to him. I said, I'm the God of your father. He said, as you are going, I will go with you. Jacob woke up out of that dream and said, the Lord is here. And then he, the question, why did God have to appear to Jacob? Because there are seasons of uncertainty and darkness in the future. That you will need assurance and conviction. So what God does with encounter is to give you what? Conviction. Maybe you're in, in between decision. Should my child go to a boarding school or should we stay? Should we move to another country or should we stay? And the future is so uncertain. Or maybe you are in between litigation and you're wondering, is it going to end or there? What encounter does is beyond what man can do. It, an encounter will give you conviction that says, hey, as you go, you can't see the future. But the one that owns the future and controls the future says it is well with your soul. That's what an encounter does. And everybody is in need of an encounter. Let's read quickly. So that, you know, let's read quickly. Genesis chapter 28, verse 10. I, I want to just give you the background. Huh. Verse 10. And Jacob went out of Beersheba and went towards Haran. And he lighted upon the certain place and tarried all night. And because the sun was set and he took of the stones of the place. And put them for his pillow and laid down in that place to sleep. The Bible says, and he had a dream, a ladder on earth that touched, that his top touched, reached to the heaven. And behold, the angel of God was ascending and descending. I, I'm just going to jump. I'm just going to jump in verse 13. And because the Lord stood above it, because, and behold, the Lord stood above the, the ladder and said, I am the God of Abraham, thy father, the God of Isaac, and the land which thou liest, I will give to you. See, you don't understand. This is why you need an encounter. Because if you're going to do one in life, you're going to take crazy. You're going to take steps that human beings are going to say it's crazy. Yes or no? But when you take those crazy steps, where do you get the boldness from? The boldness is to know that though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I know it's with me. Because what? Thou art with me. The boldness of the shepherd was not his weapon. Was with who was it him? You're going into a marriage and you're like, I don't know if you might to work or not. And the boldness is that I have a conviction. One lady in our church, she got married at a little over 40. And you know, I love to hear testimonies. So I sat down with her. I said, when you were single, 38, 39, 39, all those big years. I said, how did you feel? He said, as I was growing older, I was more convinced I would get married. He said, I was more convinced. I said, how did you get from? He said, because God has spoken to me at this age. That's what encounter does. It gives you that thing. I'll give an example. And this family is close to um, Pastor Neil here. Um, they've not had a child for five or six years, your friends, about six years. And they've been trying to have a child. They've been attending church all the while. And, you know, so I've been talking to them from time to time. You know, I will talk to them from time to time. But there was this time she had a conversation with me because they've been trying to have a child for five or six years. And when she had a conversation with me, I had faith. I had, not that she spoke, I had what I've never heard before. It was not what she said. It was what I perceived. This song said, what do you mean? The Bible says, I'm poor, perceiving in had faith. You can perceive it. That, ah, someone is talking, but you can, oh, this is still the spiritual. You can perceive the spiritual substance of what they're saying. People can talk, but you can perceive when there's force inside. As she finished with me, I called Pastor Foloke, which is Pastor Nee's wife. I said, your friend has been having a child. She's going to have a child now. He said, how do you know? I said, I heard it. Not that God told me. As she spoke, the conviction, because you must understand, when the Bible says faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, one of the word evidence in the translation is conviction. One of the things encountered, he gives you that conviction. Have you not seen people that have some kind of juju power and you say, do you know, the, the way they will hit their chest. Why are they so bold? Because there's something they rely on that they think can
can save them. What encounter gives you is that ability to hit your chest and say, who are they? Where are they? Where are they coming from? Do they know who I am? That's what, and listen to me, people that have encounter go farther than people that don't have encounters. Glory to God. Oh, you can do better than that. Glory to God. So, one of the things, one of the reasons why God, what, God does not just give encounter for reason, just, just because it feels like God, God does not, you know, God does not, sometimes God showed up in a spectacular way so that you can know. So that he can just talk to you and say, hey, I'm with you. You know, that, that, that's great because it's loving. But God just comes with a church kind of orchestration so that you can know that I am the Lord, your God. By the time he delivered Israel from Egypt, Egypt knew that Israel had a God. Even Israel, Egypt had an encounter. They had so much encounter. I don't know if you, if you saw it in your Bible. The Bible says when Israel left, that some of the Egyptians followed them. How do you follow your slaves and servants? Because you had seen what their God is. And I'm saying so because when you talk to Christians today, one of the fundamental things, you know, you know I, I, let me tell you something. One of the reasons why Christians are not deep and especially Christians that succeed is that, you know what, the reason why as the more they succeed, and all of you that lead, listen from all over the world, pay attention to this. The reason why when they succeed or they travel abroad or they have more money options, they rely less on God is this. They, you know why they do that? Because genuinely, they cannot trace their lifting success to God. Genuinely. No, it's not from a bad place. I'm not castigating them. Genuinely, they know all they have is what they work for. So, when you say God can do this, they've not personally seen it. They've not personally experienced it. So, they don't even know how to personally lean on God. But there are people that can say like Abraham, I will not take anything lest you say Abraham rich because my resources and prosperity come from heaven. Until you have such experiences, you will not know what it means when he says that, when he says that trust in the Lord with all your heart. It will be difficult because I've never experienced it before. And you know what I'm talking about. The mothers of the day, you, you know, in fact, the mothers of the day, when you see people that God bless, not the one that they say God bless them, that God bless, the more they are God bless, the more they are prayerful. The reason why they know the source, so they keep going back to the source. So when you find people that don't keep going back to the source, maybe it was not that source that really did it. Because everybody understands you must service the author that services you. Are you here, somebody? So the first thing God uses an encounter to do for us is this. He uses an encounter to give us assurance and conviction. The, the next thing God uses an encounter to do, and I'll just say this and pass, I'm not going to explain it. God uses encounters to get our attention. Because some of you, God needs to get your attention, but he's going to use an encounter to get your attention. Until he appeared to Saul with power. Saul did not know who the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ was. Some of you, there has to be some shaky for you to know who your God is. He told Moses, he said, he says, he says, I will let, he said, I will use, he says, the world does not know me. But through Pharaoh, so God picked Pharaoh. He was the strongest political power, just like the U.S. He said, I will crumble Pharaoh so that the people that are not as powerful as Pharaoh can know there's no other God than the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The third reason why God gives you an encounter is this. And I'm saying this because I really think this is what everybody needs. Everybody, see, you know, one of the things, one of the crusades I have on is a Christianity that is more than coming to church. Because sometimes you can't tell the difference in our days between religious people and people that have a personal relationship with God. And a personal relationship with God is not by saying a prayer. He's born out of a place of deep encounters. People play church. But people that have relationships have relationships. You heard the testimony of the guy that is here. Was, how do you explain 
the doctors, the, I mean, the hospital went to one of the best in the country. And they said, we can't help you. If, and they used the drug, death in one year. I mean, I had a testimony yesterday. I broke down. First of all, you know, as I was preaching, I, I said yesterday, I said, there's a lady that has a menstrual cycle that's still about one year. I said, the spirit of God is actually, it's flowing right now. The lady was in the choir. I'm menstruating her sis for over one year. She said, Pastor, I just noticed that my clothes were, he said, that's why I can't come out. Because my clothes have been stained. I feel ashamed. Another lady, I don't know if you remember the disease, prolax or prosos something. Who remembers it from yesterday? And it's a condition that makes the private part falls. And it was explained to me that someone the female private part, something meant to be hanging on top, has fallen and it's done. He said, while we're praying, it just sucked back itself. And, and let me say something to you. Some of you always say that, you know, I'm not into a very supernatural. You need experience here. One of the reasons why God gave an encounter, I didn't even put this in my notes. When God wants you to believe for the impossible, he has to use an encounter to open up your mind. So, he will do something that will, you know, because, because you are the one that will believe for it. So, for you to believe for it, he needs to do something that would open your understanding. You, let me tell you something. When you've seen God healed cancer, when you've seen God do this for someone, you will not ask yourself, is it 100 million that God cannot provide business? Which is harder, to heal cancer or give 100 million? I was sharing a testimony during next level prayer. Testimony in church. I had not really heard that testimony in details until we had, a, we had some kind of very private men's meeting, I think a week or two ago. And this guy in the men's fellowship in the Lekki church came and said, so it was a conversation that, of church and how the church had impacted you. And he said, I said, I'm coming to harvest this. And that was not why I really said, I just like the church. He said, but something changed my life. Of course, we're teaching about all of the things we're teaching. He said, I got a contract that required several tens of millions, tens or hundreds of millions. I don't know if it's tens or hundreds. Uh, it didn't specify. To execute. He said, that time I was younger, I didn't have so much money to be able to do a contract. He said, for some reason I prayed. He said, when I prayed, he said, God put the picture of someone I see in church in my mind. The guy is in church. Like, so I'm doing, he said, I said, ask him for the money. He said that, ah, ask him. Someone that does not know me. I just see him in church. How will I ask him? He said, I took the courage after some time, walked up to him and said, sir. He said, this is the IP or the contract papers I have. I just need funding. He said, the guy looked, he said, I didn't even talk to him. He just looked at me and said, you know what? Uh, take this on my call then. Tell them that I asked you to call, that you need funding. The guy took the number, called them, asked him to call his funding. They called him, but they, of course, they wanted to provide the phone, but he needed to submit some documents, and he needed what? A collateral. So he called the person that he met, that, that face he saw in church, and said, sir, yeah, this is will provide the phone, but they need collateral. He said, I don't have nothing. And the person said, come and see me. The person took a document, and said, this is a document to my, see over my house. Go and give them. The guy said, sir. He said, sir, you don't know my son anymore. He said, he said, it doesn't matter. He said, I trust you. Go and give them. When he went to give them, a few months after, deal was done, he was paid. Paid off the loan, took back the um, C of O. He went to meet this man in his office and said, sir, I brought back the C of O. Gave him the C of O. When he brought back the C of O, very powerful. He said, sir, you know that I know how this works now. That I robbed my bag, I don't know about. So he had taken a big envelope, loaded it, I'm not sure if it was dollars or naira. As at least, thank you. He gave it to the guy. The guy says, I cannot collect anything from you because it was put in my heart to help you. Let me tell you. Those are things you will know. When they say the Lord is my shepherd, it's not theory. You will understand when you say the Lord is my shepherd. It's not that I read somewhere. Mm -hmm. You will understand when the psalmist said the Lord is my shepherd because you saw him come through. When Isaac, you know the thing, eh? When Isaac, when there was famine, and God told Isaac, don't go to Egypt. Stay in, stay here. You know why it was easy for Isaac to stay? Because when Isaac was a child, he was going to be killed. His father had made up man to kill him. As they put him on the altar to be killed, out of nowhere, God said, don't touch him. He said, look on your right side. You will see the animal to kill. I was just testing your obedience. 
And in that place was where the name Jehovah Jireh comes from. Someone says, it means our provider. That's not what it means. The real meaning of Jehovah Jireh is this. The Lord that sees ahead and prepares for it. So, listen to me. That's the real meaning of Jehovah That he sees. So, the reason why he's a provider. Provider is a subset of the bigger name. That because he sees ahead, he provides for it. What does that mean? No matter the need you have, God knows you're going to have it. Let me tell you something. There's no need you have that shocks God. And God looks at Michael and said, how do we do it? Never! He knew you would have it. Before you prayed, there was provision. Praise God. Some of you are sick in your body and I said something yesterday. I said this. Every wise manufacturer of a car knows that no matter how good a car they provide, that some parts will spoil. So they will provide what? Spare parts. If human beings that are dumb compared to God knows that there should be spare parts, God that made your body and know it will decay, does he know that there will be spare parts? That means if they say you have no womb, there's spare womb. That means if your hair is dead, there's spare hair. Because you must understand it's Jehovah that sees and prepares for it. You know, I say, uh, uh, I, I'm 41. Who will marry me? Calm down. He knew you'll be 41. It's that kind of thinking that gives you conviction. Yeah, uh, what do you call it? Uh, I've now moved to London. I will let marry you. Hey! Before you got visa, didn't you know we moved to London? You were the one that is surprised. It says God that sees the end from the beginning. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I can't see the way. That's the thing. Let me tell you, you need to know what your job is and what your, what your job is not. Your job is to pray. How God wants to do it, let him do it. And if you want to clap, go ahead and clap for the Lord. <laughs> Glory to God. I, I mean, there are encounters, though. Oh, wow. I want to ask, just, let me just, just by chance, has anybody had something that has been a defining moment, an experience that changed everything? You had an encounter that changed everything. Anybody like that? It's not everybody. I'm going to, I'm going to, I want to see if I can call someone to answer. So I want to tell you ahead of time. So everybody doesn't raise up their hand so you can think about it very well. You know, anybody here? Back again? Anybody? Just wave your hands above your head. Do you, do you have a microphone? Yeah, please give it to Samaka. Let us share. Samaka, come and share. I wanted to hear something. Come and share. An encounter. Just, just let it come. Let it come. And, and the reason why I wanted to see this is that when we talk about these things, it's not what a pastor, because you would think that, eh, you know, if you're not as rich as Pastor Dio, eh, Pastor Deji, Pastor Fojo, then it can happen to you. Yes, ma'am. Please go ahead and share. So, um, my first song, I've really not shared it, but I'm going to share it in public. So when I gave birth to him, and um, there was something wrong in his penis, anyway. So um, we traveled to, for, done like four surgeries. And the last one was actually outside the country. The defining moment was when we did the last surgery, when we spent so much on the last surgery. And the next day, he couldn't wee wee. He was screaming that he was in pain. At that moment, I think it was on a Sunday, we were meant to come back to Nigeria. On Monday, my husband was in church. I remember calling him and saying, this is what the doctor said, that we have to come back for another surgery or extend our ticket. Or come back. That's like a, a boy that has gone through like... This is, this is less than 10, right? <laughs> yeah. So, and at that moment, I actually, I called my friend. She's a pastor as well. They didn't really have an answer. But she said one thing, and my husband says one thing. God is in control. My son joined me. We prayed and prayed and prayed, and we went to bed. We decided that we were coming back home because I couldn't bear him. The doctor through. had said, watch this now, had said, he will need another surgery. This is a sick surgery on his pregnant part. Do you know what it looks like as a child just having just like something... What are they even operating? The 
reason why is, you know, when we share this story, you know, it's like flat. You know, I want it to be in the moment. And imagine what it means for a mother. She had all the thoughts that will be flying through what the devil will be saying to her. How, how were you feeling? At that moment, I was, I, was, I was asking why, how. But I think I cried, we slept off. Mm. In the morning, my son called me, just, Mommy, I can wee wee. And the amazing part was Thank that. You, Jesus. The surgery, the, the woman was coming out from another place, so it was quite open. So the thing got sealed. You know when God had to put a sand. Hold on, you, you didn't get it. The we should come this way, but it's coming two this, ways. Two ways. There was another place it was coming out from. Yeah, because some of you think you have problems, you don't have problem. I'm telling you, you don't have a problem. Co continue, ma'am. It got sealed. As in sealed that it was just coming out from the right place. The way it should be. How it should be. I thought I was just... I was uh, uh, this is my question. I mean, this is a big test, buddy. This one I want to ask you, when this happened, how did it affect your faith? How did it affect your perspective of life, the challenges? How did it affect everything? Did it affect, yeah? Yes, I, at that moment, I said, if God can, what I have spent so much on, can just, in, in the night, there's nothing else anybody can tell me. Praise God. Thank you, man. Thank you, man. See, that's what I call an encounter. It's, Throughout, her, let me tell you, an encounter that experience that you build a stone there. In your mind, you build a stone there and say, God did this. The doctor said, come back for a surgery. The sixth one. Do you know how much you need to travel to India and come back? Glory to God. So, the reason why I'm saying so is that huh, when you have your own challenge, would there be a stone you have built that you can always refer back to and say, God did this? And, and that's why, you know, when we say we're fasting and praying, this is what the connection. One of the reasons why we keep pressing in fasting and prayer is that we want to make sure we have an encounter. So God is not the God of our pastor. He's the God that did it for me. It's good to ask me to pray for you. But the biggest blessing you can do for yourself is to learn how to pray for yourself. And have faith in your own prayers. But the way you have faith in your prayers is because of the things that happen to you. Glory to God. The second reason why God gives an encounter is this. He wants to give you a promise. He wants to give you a promise. One of the most confusing things is this concept with promise and God. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 18 says this. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 18. He says, we understand that by two immutable things, Hebrews chapter 6 verse 18, it's a God which cannot lie. I, I, look at what it is. It's by, that by two immutable things, it was impossible for God to lie. So the question is, this question, if God cannot lie, then why does he need to promise? Sister, you know, the only reason why you tell me to promise is because you think I will change my mind. You say, Pastor, we promise you will come tomorrow. Promise you come tomorrow. Because you think I will change my mind. So the question is that nobody asks him to promise. So why does he take it upon himself to promise? Because what? <laughs> Listen to me. When Abraham had another encounter with God. And he says, how is Sarah? And he says, <laughs> man. He says, I, I, he was doubting and the, the, God gave him a promise. He, he said, by this, he said, by this time, according to time of life, he says, Sarah shall have a child. The purpose of that encounter was to give him what? A promise. Why does God promise when he doesn't lie? The only reason why God, I mean, the reason why God promises this, because God's promise.
promise. And the reason I'm saying this to you is this. Because God's promise is an anchor. What's an anchor? Think of a, think of a ship. When a ship is going, they will throw down something to hold in that. Your belt. Oh, oh, I have an anchor actually. I have an anchor. So I kind of lost a little bit of weight. If I don't wear these suspenders, my trousers will begin to fall off. An anchor is what holds you so that you don't fall off. So the question is this. <laughs> Why does God give you an anchor? The reason is this. Because in the dark seasons of life, you will need something to hold on to when the wind blows contrary. There will be seasons where there is a delay you cannot explain. You will need something to hold on to. There will be seasons where things are not working as you thought it should work. You will need something to hold on to. There will be seasons when there is no body to help. And you will need something to hold on to. So you know what God gives you? God says, ahead of those seasons, take an anchor. Let, let me just use a better illustration that will help you. Is anybody here that is engaged? Someone that is engaged in this place? Just wave your hands. Let me see. Come on. I know you're engaged, but you, you know, now, now you're hiding. Don't deny him. That's not a good thing to do. So if you engage, just anybody in the choir? Anybody, anybody? You know, I need to find somebody. You need to help me. Anybody? If you know your, if your friend is engaged, just raise up your hand on, on, on our behalf. On our behalf. You're, you're engaged, right? Where is she? No, no, your friend here. Anybody here? Woo, 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 woo. She, okay, come, come. Where's the person? Just point me. Just tap the person. Come, come, come. Yeah. She's engaged, right? I, I even know. I didn't even know that. Are you wearing your ring? You've removed it. <laughs> Go back and wear it. Go back and wear it. <laughs> now she's really shy about this engagement. Quickly, quickly, quickly. I want to show you what an anchor looks like from this illustration. You need to be patient with me. Uh, uh, anybody engaged online? Right, I'm engaged. If I'm not engaged, right, I'm not engaged. And the reason why is that all the people, all the thousands of people watching like, oh, she's single, praise God. And make sure you change your profile picture to make it nice. Yeah, because last few months, I heard about a couple that met in the online church. They, just through commenting, they met and they're getting married end of the year. <laughs> Wonderful. Show us the ring. This ring is an anchor. What does the ring show? I want to tell you what the ring shows. Are you married? No. But what does this ring tell you? He's right. Huh? Commit me. Thank you. I'm not married, but he's committed to marrying me. That's an anchor. I have not seen what he has said, but he's committed to doing it. I've not seen the breakthrough, but the ring shows he's committed to doing it. The man has not married her, but the ring shows he is what? Committed. The ring is a promissory thing. Are you getting me, somebody? So, what the ring says is that you have something to hold on to before what I said will come to pass. You have something to hold on to that shows what I said will come to pass. You have something to hold on to that shows I'm committed. So, you are struggling with your health. The ring says, he was wounded for my transgression because the ring is a promise. He was bruised for my iniquity. The chastisement of my peace is upon him. And by stripes we are healed. How do I know that? Because I'm wearing the ring. Once I see the ring, I don't ask, like, are you dating? I ask, when are you getting married? Because it's standard that you are dating. Not that you are just dating, you're on your way to marriage. When I have the promise, this is how you know you have the ring. You don't ask God, please do it. The question is that when is it going to be done? Because doing it, he has done it. We are just in the process for what? Manifestation. So you are running this business that is small. But the ring you are wearing, which is a promise, says, 
Though your beginning may be small, your latter end shall be exceedingly great. It's not about believing for greatness. I've passed that area. I've gotten the ring. It's when will the greatness keep? I don't know if I'm talking to someone today. Because I'm wearing the ring. And sometimes I'm missing. You miss him sometimes. Yes, sir. And when are you miss him, do you rub this ring sometimes sincerely? Not really. But sometimes you do. Yes. You do sometimes. I do. Me more. You know why I rub it? Sometimes when I can't feel him or see him, I begin to rub the ring. When I can't see what God has promised, I go to my Bible and begin to romance the promises. Because the promises reminds me of his faithfulness. I don't know if you can hear me this morning. The promises remind me that my God is alive. The promises tell me that God is faithful. What he said he will do, he will do. I know that you are going through some delay. I know that the situation is depressing. I know that it seems impossible. But the Bible says, is there anything? That's a ring. That's a ring for someone. Is there anything too hard for God? That's a ring you have to romance. I know they say it's impossible. But is there anything too hard for God? Thank you. Wow. God gives us the ring as an anchor. God does not only give us the ring as an anchor. God gives us his promise as a picture of the future. Why does God give us it? So when you have an encounter, one of the things you live with is a promise. But why does God, and unfortunately, People that cannot press in for encounter, they cannot press in for a promise. But why does God give you a promise? Can I have my frame, my own frame, my personal frame, my own? I'm just giving you the, what to bring now. My own frame. Come, sir. He gives you. Can you turn to it this way? Sometimes this guy looks handsome, right? This guy looks put together, right? This is a billionaire in dollars pose. Praise God. The way this guy looks, he has no problem, right? This is called picture perfect. So what happens, take note of this. What happens is this. When I go through my, tilt a little way. Yeah. When I go through life and my life is shaky and it's not picture perfect. I'm weak, I'm sick, depressed, broke. I look at my bank account. All that is there is minimum balance. I look at all the rejection I've gotten. I don't look like this. The reason why God gives me the promise is that I can come back to the promise and look at who I'm supposed to be. And it doesn't matter what I look like. I go back to the promise and say, "Uh -uh. although my pocket is empty, the picture ahead of me say I'm settled. Although my business is small, the picture ahead of me say that it will grow. Although there is delay, the picture ahead of me say the wait is over. So I begin to hold to a picture. The challenge is this. Many of you, when you are weak, there's no picture you are holding on to. So you get so discouraged. So you get so weak. So you get so challenged. But God is saying, the reason why I give you a promise is something to hold on to. Why? The scripture is the picture of your future. Thank you. The scripture is what? The picture of your future. And sometimes, when you are in the present, there's something you are missing in your future. Oh, wow. God has said this. But I'm here and I don't have it. So God gives you a promise. Bring the one of my wife. Oh, glory to God. Glory to God. Watch this now. And this is what this happens. Oh, yeah. Right now, just for illustration, I'm not married. 
But the word of God says, I've been set to maritally. When I get discouraged, I go back to the promise I received from my encounter. Because what is missing in my life, I can see it in my future. Right now, I'm single. Right now, how many of you have someone that you're close to, that you love so much, but you miss them? And when you miss them, you flip through your phone. Because your phone reminds you of them. There are some things that are missing in your life. And when you feel like, because God knows you will feel like giving up. He puts a picture in the scripture for you. So that you can go back and be like, oh wow, this is my future. I'm not giving up right now. This is my future. Are you getting me somebody? So he puts the picture of your marriage. He puts the picture of your job. He puts the picture of when you will be living in that beautiful mansion. You are dealing with addiction. But he puts the picture of liberty from that addiction in front of you. So that when you go through that season and you feel low and missing, all I have to do is I look at the picture. Once I remember the picture, I find energy to keep going. Thank you, sir. Question. Where do I get the picture from? The picture is gotten from a place of encounter. So, if encounter is so important, why don't people have it? Because they never look for it. Because encounter is it's going to hold you. Some of you are in industries where terrible things are happening. Do you have a promise that is holding you? Some of you are in places where you're the only one there. There's no brother or sister you're watching. Do you have a picture that's holding you? I remember when we're going to have the um, NLP conference in London. I have some pastors that pastor big churches in London. And they told me, don't do it. It's a bad time. People will not come. We pastor in London. Our churches are not back to 50%. He said, so you that have no church or no presence, how do you think we'll gather a crowd? And I said to them, I said, I will. Because God has spoken to me. And I have seen what? A picture. It was, and they felt, listen, they felt so bad for me because they thought I was stupid. And I understand because they're not bad people. It's just, they're just advising me based on what they know, what they've experienced. And that's why you must be careful who you take advice on. Because people advise you on their experience, not on what God is saying. Because people advise you based on their experience, not what God is saying. Saul looked at David and said, you can't fight Goliath. You are a child. He's a, he's, a, he's a warrior from a child. And David said, you don't understand my dealings with God. In the backside of the desert, I was having encounters with the Almighty. And before you know, we did encounter. I'm sorry, next level prayer conference. And the next story. Because all of a sudden now, London conference is not a trend. Because God used somebody to break it up. But if I'd listened, that would not be done. You must know something, eh? What God wants to do in your life is beyond you. Because its impact on you and on other people is there. That's why you must press in. And that's why some of you ladies here, you must make sure your mind you'll be the first millionaire, billionaire in dollars. That did not sleep around. So that you can look at other ladies and say, I didn't do it. God did it. You can also do it. We must have business men and women here that will not steal government money. And mail cool cash. And can stand and say, they stole money but I didn't. If anybody think I stole, speak up now. And when others see that God did it for you. Like Mary, when he saw God did it for Elizabeth. She was able to believe that God would do it. For her. But where does he start? He starts from a place of encounter. Oh wow, someone says encounter is so powerful. It is so powerful because without encounter, there's no anchor in dark times. Don't say, I hope so. You don't have an encounter. People that have encounter say, I hope so. <laughs> People that have encounter speak like Paul in Acts chapter 2, 20. Paul says, I know it shall be even as it was told me. Oh, back in Let me show you a scripture. I, I, I thought I would jump in. Act 20, act, um, oh, where, where, where's the scripture now? No, no, no. Act 26, verse 14. Oh, oh wow. My God. 
Act 26, verse 14. That, that's what I'm looking for. The, the scripture I'm looking for is this. And you can help me look for your pastors. Come to me in Jesus' name. 27, 29. 25, 29. Tell me what it says. No, no, no. The scripture I'm looking for is this. Where it says, I go bound to Jerusalem. This is the reason why. Everybody around Paul was saying, don't go. Don't go. Don't go. In fact, a known prophet called Agabus did not know that the cloth was Paul. He took Paul's cloth and tied it on his leg and tied it on his hands. He says, don't share the Holy Ghost. The person that holds this cloth, this will do, will do when, he gets, when he gets to Jerusalem. Look what he says. He says, and now I go bound. Like, he says, not that I want to go. I'm bound in the spirit. Look at this. He says, not knowing what shall befall me. Some of you, you are going bound into an industry. Some of you are going bound into a business. You, you don't even know. Some of you are going bound into ministry. He says, I'm, I don't have all the data. I'm just going bound. Oh my God. See the next line. Not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Watch this. Verse 23. Save that the Holy Ghost witness in every city saying bonds and affliction will come there. He said, but it doesn't matter because the one that said there will be bond and affliction is the one that said go. How can you go into tough, how can you go into politics in Africa when you have not had an encounter? They will use your life to eat lunch. There are certain sectors of business you cannot enter into because the, the oligarchy in the democracy that control that industry will not allow you in. One brother told me, he said, I needed money. He said, come and join us. He said, how much do you need? He said, starters will give you 300 million. He said, the next time we'll give you 800. He said, but you have to belong to our meeting. He said, which meeting? He said, when you join, you will know. He said, I know them. He said, and these are the powers of my industry. He takes, let me tell you something. Eh? When Christians bow down to all courts, it's because they've not had an encounter. I heard a story one time. <laughs> I heard a story one time. <laughs> this brother had a challenge at work. He told another brother in church. And that's why you don't just say, I choose a friend in church. Go to cell. Look, see, go to cell. Join his cell. Look at their life very well before he says your friend. I went and chose the brother. He told his friend, I said, I have a problem. I said, oh, let's go to Ibado. They went to Ibado. And he took him to Ibadalist. And as soon as he took him to Ibadalist, they entered. And he said, Baba, I bought my friend. He told the friend to go out. He, now, he, now, he, he, he were told him there. He said, I can't help your friend. He said, Baba, please help me now. The guy knelt and said, Baba, help me. He told the real guy that brought him to go to stay and the other guy to go out. He said, why do you bring that kind of person here? He said, why can't you help him? He said, what is inside is what I want to have. The guy out, went out and brought him. He said, why can't you help me, sir? He said, as you came in, I saw the light on your head. I know what the light means. The people that have this sign, they have more power than me. Oh. But that guy has something. But there's no encounter that's revealed to him what he has. How do you have an encounter? The first thing, the first thing of an encounter. So first steps to have an encounter. The first thing is hunger. The reason why I said hunger is this, and maybe that's a challenge with a lot of people. A lot of people are just okay. They just, you know, that's the thing. With that, that's the thing. If you eat junk, you will not have time for real food. You, you know, so much motivational talk, so much this talk, so much uh, oh, single, single. People say, I love the church because they dance. <laughs> it's good we dance, but church is what they're dancing. What's hunger? Hunger is that I'm not a Christian that comes to church. I'm a Christian that has depth and roof. In Christ. I'm not looking for church. I'm looking for God. When I come, I'm looking for something dynamic. It's hunger. The reason why is that the same way in the US they spend dollars. In China they spend yen. In the UK they spend um, pounds. In the spirits, hunger is our spiritual currency. That's why Jesus Christ said, blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they shall be filled. Hunger is spiritual. So, someone says, why don't I have an encounter? Because you're not hungry for it. 
Any small problem you are looking for, man, you are looking for how to solve. See, once you have hunger, you say, God, I'm here. You heard the lady's testimony. They've been going to hospital, going to hospital. But eventually when they traveled abroad, that we all thought that once you go and see the best of doctors with track record, they will just do it one time surgery and do. And when the best doctor did it, and it got worse, she said, I will go to who I know, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God said, that's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. It happened. Maybe the reason why you don't have hunger is that you have not had problems that pursue you to God. Oh, you live in the United Kingdom. You live in the United States. <laughs> what, what problem do you have? Everything is credit card. <laughs> they say fast and pray. They say they fast too much. Because you don't have the problems we have. <laughs> Read the Bible. John the Baptist to the disciples says, well, are your disciples not fasting? He said, they don't need to, there's no need to fast now. Because all they will fast is on me. I'm fasting for them. He said, but when I go, they know bond them when not to fast. No, 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 no. You know what? You know what I'm fasting now. You know, you know, the reason why you're not fasting, I understand. That. What is there to fast for? Wife is doing well. Husband is doing well. Children are doing well. Husband, everyone is doing well. Driver is there. Car is there. House is there. Pounds is there. Dollar is there. Ticket is there. What's there to fast for? But the time will come. Praise God. So the first... The first thing about encounter is hunger. And I said this in the first service. I said, the way God deals with you, this is the way God deals with you. God uses hunger to draw you. The second thing, the second thing about fasting um, about encounters is this. And that's why, one of the reasons why we fast is this. Let me tell you something. Anything that kills your flesh gives you spiritual hunger. So when you make your flesh fast, your spiritual appetite will begin to rise. The second reason why, the second, the second part to encounter is pursuit. It's not enough to say I'm hungry. You must do something about it. It's the decision that matters. So Zacchaeus went and climbed on a tree. And Jesus Christ said, Zacchaeus, come down. But people were following him. He was the one that pursued the most. Rich man forgot he was rich, climbed on the tree. The reason why he was, he wanted, him, and why is pursuit important? The reason why is that separation precedes encounter. There are some things that cannot happen with everybody and everything happening around you. You need a situation where you are quiet in your spirit and you can hear it, but still and know, I am the Lord. The third thing, the third thing, the third thing, <laughs> glory to God, glory to God. The third thing about encounter is this. There's a place to tarry. He says in Luke chapter 24 verse 49. He says, tarry in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. You know, you know, and there's a message I preach. You can go back and listen to it on YouTube. It's the importance of consistent prayers. Well, Wednesday will be explosive. You need to be here. You know, important of consistent prayer. Because People say, why do you pray for such a long time? Why are we praying every day? Can't we just pray once and pray next year? And pray once in 10 years? I mean, if I've asked that question before. Very important question. Ah, from this prayer to that prayer, from this prayer to that prayer. The reason is simple. And you not say, but my friend did not pray so much to get our own result. Is it not true? Uh, but prayer is like cooking. How long something stays on fire depends on what you're cooking. Some people, the reason why their prayer works that way is because they are cooking domain. Three minutes is done. Because the case is in domain case. But some people it is rice. It's going to take some long time. Some people it's not rice. It is beans. You have to parboil. <laughs> you will have cooked many in domain before beans is even parboiled. The question is that what are you cooking? You are busy comparing yourself to Sunday. No one I just can't look at the disciples and say, couldn't you wait for one hour? What he was saying is this, what we are going through now, it needs one hour to finish it. Hey, man, 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 you know, I, I, I'm not the kind of praying. Man, man, man. Uh, my brother, this 21 days, you need to cook it and it will be done. It will be done. Is it tasty? You have to taste it. Taste. Is it done? No, it remains more. You're pressing. Because until it's done, you can't put salt. 
So you're wondering why the salt is not there. Why the flavor is not coming out. Until it's done, you can't put salt. And there are people that will keep looking at other people. And the food will never be done. Because they are taking it off the fire. They get so easily discouraged. Someone say, I will pray. Someone say, I will pray. Just imagine Jesus. Just, just imagine Jesus was so, he said, couldn't you tarry with me? For he looked at them and said, don't you get it? That this next phase, we need an hour here. For this next phase, you need an hour here. Do you know the requirement for the next phase? Sometimes it's not the time you pray long prayer, but sometimes you have to stay at it. There was a year, I, was, I mean, I was showing the leaders, in the last two, three, or four years, in one year, I fasted 200 days. People thought I was Jimmy. It was fasting that was making me lose weight. And the reason why is that until it is done, we keep cooking. We keep cooking until what? It is done. The last thing, so you see Tari. Didn't you notice how Moses had the encounter? He stayed with God in the mountain until his face began to shine. He stayed. I can't get up and do let's have a prayer. Okay, sleep. That will be more helpful to your destiny. The last thing is Psalm 50 verse 5. How do I? So the first word of encounter is hunger. The second one is what? Pursuit. So the third one is you tarry consistency. And the fourth one is sacrifice. See, the day Abraham sacrificed Isaac, but he didn't eventually kill him, God came down and spoke to him. Psalm 50 verse 5, see what it says. Read it together. Gather my saints unto me that have made a covenant with what? With what? He didn't say gather all the born again. He said the ones that have made covenant with what? Sacrifice. The day Solomon offered sacrifice, God came down that night and said, oh boy, you disturb me, I will disturb you. The question is this, this is a question. What sacrifice do you need to make for encounter? Some of you, you have to let, let this go for the next 21 days and fast it away. Social media, some people. Some of you, the Lord has been dealing with you about your giving habits, how you need to be a fighting Christian. How you need to be, how you need to give this kind of offering and sow this kind of seed and do that. But you're withholding and God is saying, God, that to me, the saints that have made covenant with sacrifice. What sacrifice? Some of you, it's a step to serve. I say, I don't have time. And God is saying, you don't understand. You only gather by sacrifice. Offer the sacrifice and let the encounter come. How long will you withhold the sacrifice and prevent your encounters? And that's why when you go through a thing, there's something to hold on to. Glory to God. It's a challenge. Oh. Some of you, the sacrament is that I will be in church every Sunday. I, you, that's the sacrament. Some of you, you know, you, say, hey, you know, the reason I'm not giving that, I'm watching online. What, what does that have to do with your giving? And if I'm not praying, it's my, my, I'm a doctor, and so what? You will what? Sacrifice. Shall we pray? Please stand on your feet. Lord, I desire an encounter. Lord, I desire. I, I'm, Lord, reignite a promise that will give me an anchor for the future in my heart. Let's go ahead and pray. 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 I, I want you to hunger, to thirst, to hunger, to thirst. And Father, this is my personal prayer for everyone. That there will be a summon of the spirits that will provoke hunger in the heart of everyone. We thank you that people will have encounters. We're going through a tough time globally that people will have anchors. 
that during these days of fasting and prayer, they will be able to submit themselves for experiences. That they will be able to say in the years to come, it was in 2022 September that this word was released. That the reason I'm not disturbed is because there's a word that sustained me through the season. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. You can have your seats. Praise the Lord.